Thanks oh, for man. Man. Pack my well, we're we're on. Our next speaker, Charles Ostman. He's uh, been in Berkeley for about 30 years or so. He was 10 years at the famous Lawrence Livermore Labs. He's also worked at Los Alamos. He's worked on Star Wars. He's worked for Lucasfilm, doing digital sound and video for them. He's part of a think tank called the Institute of Global Futures in San Francisco, and he goes to Washington, D.C. at least twice a year to check up with people there on his uh, work. And he's also part of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which was started several years ago. Currently, he's working with the Millennium Project with Jerry Glenn, trying to change the nature, excuse me, the nature of economic practice. And he's uh, co-chair of Global Clean Tech 2006, Vice President of NanoSig, did work uh, with conferences, putting together uh, scientists and inventor, investors. And uh, George Gabori, who's head of the San Francisco Tesla Society, says that Charles is a master of getting people networked. Well, okay. Which is really one of the most important skills there is. But he's also a master of nanotechnology. Let's welcome Charles Osman. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. I have to say this is probably the most interesting audience I've ever tried to talk to because most of the audiences I deal with are either all technical or all investor types or VCs and that sort of thing. This is such a great mix and I really appreciate being here. And speaking of um, at the last talk, this is a true story. Dr. Lawrence, who was the founder of the laboratory I worked at for many years, uh, back in the 30s, early 40s, they built their first accelerator about this big around, like a dinner plate size thing. They had it up on a pedestal about the size of this box here, the power supply. Here's Dr. Lawrence with a toroidal antenna saying, where's the beam, where's the beam? They couldn't find the beam. And he leans up against the thing, he's holding it next to his head, the beam is going right through his head. Now he won the Nobel Prize two years later. I'm not sure they're related, but you know, it's a thought. I just had to throw it out there. Okay. So um, anyway, I'm going to try to do this standing backwards. I hope I get this right, and I will not fall off, I hope. Um, so what I'm going to try to talk about today is not just technology, although you're going to see lots of pictures of nanocrystals, thin films, solar cells, some quantum stuff, even a little bit of element 115, just for fun, because it's one of my favorite topics. But I also want to talk about spirit, intent, belief in the larger spirit, God, however you want to choose that. And when we first came here, we drove in with a bunch of folks. John and his son and all these other people got together and we were having this big powwow. And the first thing John does was he says, I'm going to have a prayer. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And he starts talking about service to others before oneself, just right out of the blue. And I thought, this is incredible. I mean, it was like a epiphanal moment. Light was coming on because over the handful of years I've been working with venture capitalists, patent attorneys, all kinds of bureaucrats in the government. One thing I've discovered, people are starting to get it. If we don't change our ways, if we don't see the larger picture, if we don't see the whole plan as like a large family of sorts, nothing's going to be of any, it's all going to be kaput. Five years ago, I would have never believed this. 
but I've heard people now that I would have never thought I could hear this from in the past saying, how do we make this work better for everyone else? It's astonishing. And then when I heard John say this prayer, it's like, it's like something's happening here. It's like this wave coming over folks. So I, I want to really highlight that concept because it's kind of important. It's one thing to have technology, but as you all probably know, if we don't have the right kind of support, the right kind of investment, the right kind of government support, and, and acceptance of what you're trying to do, it's never going to get off the ground. And this is what's changing. So perception is a big deal. And hold on one sec. Speaking of perception, I need to perceive water. So hold on one sec here. Hold on. Fluids are wonderful. Okay, I'm not sure it's magnetic, but it's great. Okay, so here we go. Um, now, one thing I want to kind of bring your attention to, this journal over here called The Economist, oh, yes, thanks so much, photons, here. I read this kind of stuff all the time. It's not light reading, but for the folks that do the work I do, it's kind of relevant. Um, we look at the intersection of policy, geopolitical strategy, finance, big banking, et cetera, and how technology sort of drives those, those engines. And look what's on the cover. Now, five years ago, you would have never seen this. I mean, this is a rad you have to understand how radical this is. This is a very conservative journal. And for them to talk about environmentalism as a good thing, as a profitable thing, look at the dollar sign that they sort of, you know, uh, photoshopped it into the trees. This is a big deal to find that in their cover. At the same time, you see this kind of, you know, home power, et cetera, all these magazines coming out telling you how to do it for yourself and how to small communities can sort of do their own power. This, is, this would have been unheard of five years ago. And even now, you can go into your local grocery store, even your Walmart, heaven forbid, and you know, find this on the counter. So I mean, it's kind of interesting to see this transition happening. But the thing I really wanted to bring attention to was this. CFO Magazine, that's chief financial officer. That says corporate, that says hardcore, big time, big money. It's, that, that's like the trade journal for people that run big corporations. Look what's on their cover, October 26th. Companies are suddenly discovering the profit potential of social responsibility. This was John's prayer, as I saw it two years ago, on the cover of CFO magazine, the most conservative, high-end, big tech, big money magazine there is. Something's happening out there. People are starting to get it. That's why I feel encouraged. That's why I feel so much impetus to sort of go in this direction. So I just want to kind of give you that sense of it. And the main feature of today's talk, really, is this idea of here that it's the combination, oops, hold on, let's just see more, aha, investment, sustainable business, and what I mean by sustainable is it's one thing to have a business that works, but it's another thing to have a business that actually does not impact the planet, in fact, gives back to the planet more than you take from it, that's an interesting idea, and this concept of clean technologies. And the thing that makes it possible is, whoops, hold on, nanotechnology. So I'm gonna try to show in as many ways as possible how the tools of nanotechnology make this process much more doable than what it would have been, say, even 10 years ago. And just to kind of get this point across, I've been to two of these. These are very high-end, very fancy, very expensive conferences, but I, they pay me to go to these things. Uh, this is IBF, International Business Forum. This is one of the largest consortiums in the world that put on these very big sort of high-end events. This one's in Palm Springs. And notice what they combined. See how they combined clean tech and nanotech? It's not by accident. In fact, NAST, which is a very large uh, sort of American organization, they also had their, their second now clean tech, nanotech combined conference. And in fact, if you go on the web and just do a search on clean, green, and nano, you'll get dozens and dozens and dozens of events. Five years ago, this never happened at all. So clearly, the high end of big money, big investment, they're starting to see this picture as something very real and tangible. But there is another point of view. And uh, not to intrude on anyone's religion, that's not my thing, but I have heard it told to me that nanotech is like this forbidden fruit. You know, are we tapping into something we shouldn't be tapping into? And here's how I see this. We were given free will. We are God's creatures or the largest spirit, however you want to see this. But it all fits together into it like a gigantic hologram. It's part of a system. The fact that we now have a better set of tools is not violating the rules of nature, in my humble opinion. Rather, it is the rules of nature. I mean, how many folks saw the film 2001 Space Odyssey? Anybody? Okay, good. And there's that scene at the very beginning, they, they have the quasi-ape hominids, and they're sitting around the pond, and they're going, rah, 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 and they're sort of arguing, and all of a sudden, the one ape comes up, and he touches the obelisk, and, you know, and the spark comes in. What's the first thing he does? He grabs a bone. A bone, wow, a tool, cool. 
What's he do with that bone? Smashes in the head of his neighbor as they're fighting over the water pond, right? Then he throws the bone up in the air and the bone's spinning around, all of a sudden you see the space station floating around. Well, that's, we have a bigger bone now, a better bone, a more complex bone. But the bone's still spinning around in the air. So it's not the bone that is the contention. It's how we apply it. If you want to believe, and I do, that God or the larger spirit gave us free will, it's the free will and how it's applied. That's where the epicenter of value is, not in the tool. So there are some folks that do see literally as nanotech as being the forbidden fruit and, you know, here's Eve holding the apple, how dare you touch this thing? But no, that's the wrong point of view, in my humble opinion. It's how we use the tool. And can we use the tools of nature to be more compatible with nature? I say yes. That's what I'm going to try to argue today. Okay. So, just to go over this. Um, I, should, I thought I should try to define nanotech, but before I can do that, let's define what nanotech is not, because there's a lot of strange controversies. Now, everybody's probably seen this book, Prey. This is also another book that came out by John Marlowe called Nano. He's a local writer in San Francisco. And notice the cover, the Golden Gate Bridge being dissolved by nanites, right? Hmm? Uh, X-Files did an uh, episode in their TV series a long time ago, some nanites that float around cause harm. No, this is true. It's all craziness. But people have believed these ideas, thinking that they're going to happen. Hold on one sec, speaking of nano, some more fluids. And what I want to suggest to you is that there are some safety concerns with applied nanotechnology, but this is not one of them. It sells books, makes great movies, has nothing to do with reality. So I'm going to try to give you a very precise vision of stuff in the lab, what's being done, what really works, versus the kind of the, I don't know, PR version of this. Okay, so we go from here. A little bit of history. Um, Richard Feynman won the Nobel Prize in 1956. In 1959, he made a very famous statement. He said, there's a lot of room at the bottom. And a lot of folks were kind of thinking about, you know, the next generation of material. I'm a material science guy, that's my background. So for a lot of folks in material science, they were thinking about the next generation of new chemistries and new metals and, you know, ceramics and so forth. But this guy says, forget all that. How about if you go down to the actual atomic level? Lots of space down there, lots of space. What if you could actually work in that arena and make things happen in a very organized way? This was a radical concept. A lot of folks were talking about it, but he was the first one to sort of crystallize the concept. And in fact, the film Forbidden Planet, which I believe came out in 1960 or 61, somewhere in that area. Anybody seen the film Forbidden Planet? Right? Yes? Okay. In Forbidden Planet, there was this mythical civilization called the Krell. The Krell had advanced this wonderful status where they could, they had created this giant fusion engine and they had a, a, a spectacular, like a network system where you could just think of anything and it just materialized. It was like sort of like the ultimate nanotech meets the ultimate society. But they forgot one small detail. They turned the machine on, all the Krell hooked up and they were all about to think of beautiful things and have, you know, the whole idea was if you didn't have to worry about physical things, buying stuff, money, having to go through all these efforts to have more physical things, if you could just free yourself from that kind of want aspect, then we'd be like solving all the sins of life, right? But there was a slight problem with that idea. Anybody know what the uh, punchline for that film was? Anybody want to scream it out? Yes, no? Aha! There's a smart guy in the audience. This is good. That was the point. They fired the machine up. What they did not recognize was their own internal demons, their own sort of inner dark self, that, that yin-yang that we heard about earlier. They didn't know how to, they weren't quite ready for it. They didn't have the spiritual maturity to really understand what they were stepping into. And so as I present to you some different ideas about how to create things, how to actually use nanotech in a productive way, I have to temper that with this, oops, uh-oh, I'm in trouble? Can, can you talk a lot slower? Okay. So the mic can hear you so they can get you. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, a little bit slower. So the basic idea was they did not quite synchronize their spiritual maturity index, as I call it, with their sort of technical tools of the time. So I present to you the idea that we are at that crossroads now. We have some very powerful, beautiful technical tools. The theory is, or the hope is, that we would have the spiritual maturity to use them in sync with the power of those tools. So anyway, so Richard Fenman brought up this idea. The film Forbidden Planet came out. A lot of folks started talking about it. It became a big new thing. Then a couple of decades later, this fellow came along, Eric Gretzler. He's right here, the guy in the middle. And, uh, whoops, here we go. And he founded something called the Foresight Institute, which I was a member of for many years. 
And in the early days, it was all about life extension and you know, creating new artificial beings and being able to upload your soul to a machine. You know, pretty interesting, but kind of far out stuff. I thought it was fun, but I thought it was kind of unrealistic. And I'm sort of a technical guy. I like to actually see physical prototypes. I like to build stuff. I like to be in a lab and see schematics and flowcharts and you know, show me some lab notes and some test equipment. So I, I wasn't quite really in sync with that, but I thought it was interesting. But then, but then, a little bit later, people like this fellow here, Richard Smalley, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 96 for his development of fullerene chemistry, buckyballs, that sort of thing. He sadly passed away, but what I'm trying to show you is a progression between the first real thinker that made this a big issue, the guy who popularized it, and then the real science that followed it behind. And there's a kind of a sequence of events there that I wanted to bring to your attention. And so in the middle of all this, how many folks have heard of Bill Joy? Anybody? Okay. And Bill Joy, who was the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, a, a very big computer company in California, very smart guy, I've talked to him many times, he wrote this very famous article that came out in Wired Magazine, gosh, about eight, eight or nine years ago now. And in that article, he talked about the threat of nanotechnology, gray goo, um, nanites on the loose that would digest and sort of reconvert all the matter on Earth into this sort of generic sort of gray slime and pretty scary stuff. Now, he's a computer scientist, not a material scientist, but it was interesting to have a guy of that caliber express that level of concern. And he talked about spiritual maturity and the gap between and awareness and knowing what to do versus the tools we currently have. So in a sense, it was a good moment to have that kind of balance, counterbalance. And I personally have gone to Washington, D.C. quite a few times, actually. I spent three hours talking to the FDA at one point about medical devices and regulatory codes that might apply to nanotech and medicine. I addressed folks in the NIOSH and OSHA standards boards and all that kind of thing. So I mean, people are thinking about this. And it's an interesting moment in time because what we have now or a series of books that have come out. I'm actually in this one, in case you want to go look for it somewhere. But people are trying to actually now create uh, a range of opinions so that the outside world can understand more effectively what nanotech really is and why it's relevant. So you can actually go fetch up this. This is Rosalind Byrne's book. Uh, it's on Amazon. I'm in there my little couple of pages. But the whole point is it's a nice compendium of a whole bunch of folks who talk about this process, this development, and what it means to civilization. Now, speaking of books, there's quite a few. Now, for, for my two sensors, I'm much more of a technical guy. So this book in the middle, this encyclopedia right here, great book. It's kind of expensive, but it's a, it's a multi-volume set. It's probably the best compendium there is. Hold on one more time. More fluids. Nice fluids. Lovely fluids. I love them. Um, anyway, if you're an engineer, scientist, you're working on a new invention, you would probably start with this encyclopedia because it would give you probably the most complete uh, sort of glossary of all the different materials and processes that involve nanotech. If you want to get a sense of the history, the Pioneer's book is a great book. I thoroughly recommend it. But in a different context, this is kind of where I live these days. Um, I actually spend a lot of time working with other groups as an analyst, trying to project where the industry is going, who's buying what, what companies are investing where, et cetera. It went from zero to almost a trillion dollars in about eight years. So there's a lot of publications. And I actually write, I write for something called the Nano Investor News. It's one of those publications. And if you want to get a sense of where the markets are, this is one example. This is Tim Harding's group in Europe. He produces something called Scientifica, which I also write for sometimes. And it just kind of gives you a sense of how far this has already gotten. But the real measure, the most important measure there is, when you see a whatever for dummies book, then you really know that something's matured. And sure, sure enough, there's the Nanotech for Dummies book. It's a real book. It's actually quite fun. But again, there's a whole variety of these different uh, books that are out. There's over 300 titles out there now. And this one is actually kind of interesting because, again, when I was testifying to the FDA and to other folks in Washington, D.C., we were really concerned about this kind of idea of ethics. Could we, in advance, before the science got you know, sort of ahead of us, determine some kind of a standard or some kind of a protocol for a universally or, or globally understandable set of parameters or specs, uh, like safety and so forth. And there's even more interesting issues. Um, as we approach the boundary point of being able to actually put things into the human body, put things into our brain physically to affect our thinking, our senses, extend life, 
uh, create new medical devices which really can extend life to probably 150 years, that's not that far off. Where are the ethical boundaries? How do we regulate this? Who is allowed to have it? What international treaties or standards can be established so that there's a kind of a universal code? And a lot of folks are thinking, so anyway, you can get a sense of this, and that's, to have gone from nothing to this level of infrastructure took about 15 years. That's the pace or the acceleration of how fast this has gone. Okay, and now, to get more to the sort of technical side, a lot of journals have come out with their version of what they think Nanotech is. This is Scientific American, it's the most generic, the sort of you know, popular kind of science journal there is. This was their way of describing it. They talk about size, okay, size is one way, but you know, to me it's a little bit misleading. Okay, 10 to the minus nine, that's nano, but what's that really mean? I mean, okay, it's so the one thing where a guy can say smaller is better and it's okay, that's a joke, sorry. But anyway, so the point is, is that really relevant? I say not, here's why. Because I look at complexity. I look at not just how small is the thing, but rather what can you make with the thing? That's what turns me on. So I'm gonna back away from size and look more at this. Things natural versus things man-made. A lot of people have talked about living things as being the ultimate sort of platform by which to measure our attempts at getting into this arena. I say that we actually are making living things to a certain extent. In fact, there's a whole new science called synthetic biology, and you can do a web search on Google, and you'll see you know, hundreds of pages of material. In my book, if I had to evaluate a new product, a new company, a new something, the thing for me that would kind of float my boat is not how small of a thing they made, but rather, what can they make with the small things? What level of complexity? Can they make something that's cheaper, better, easier, or can't be made at all through other means? That's what turns me on. So I'm gonna go a little further. Oops, hello machine, yes. This is, this is how I see it. Nanotech is about being able to approach that level of complexity. If I can make something as complex as a living rodent, let's say, not that I wanna make one, but something of that level of complexity, with a very minimal amount of resource, not with some gigantic factory that consumes you know, huge amounts of material and dumps carbon in the atmosphere, but something that, like, like nature, uses a very low energy status to create something highly complex and functional. Now you've got to win. This is where I want to go. So most of the stuff I'm going to be showing you is about that concept, okay? So the simple Occam's razor, this is the Charles Osmond version of nanotech, whatever, take it, believe it. It's the precise manipulation of matter the molecular scale of interaction. That is, moving atoms or molecules around to line up or set up or do something in a very controlled fashion at that scale. And what is that in technology not? It's not an end goal. Um, everybody, when they go out and buy a computer, do you care what's Intel inside? Well, maybe some of you, but you know, you buy the box, turn it on, screen, type away, everything's fine. You really could care less what chips in there. Well, same thing can be said for a nano. In many products today, nano's already there. You won't even know if nano's inside or not. The product might be better, might be cheaper, might be more interesting, but you won't even know the nano manufacturing process. So in a way, people keep asking me, well, when's nanotech gonna be here? When's it gonna be here? When's it gonna be here? Well, it's already here. Actually, it's been here for billions of years. We're just kind of borrowing little bits of it now. There is no end point in nano. All nano is is a process. It's not an end point. That was the whole of it. But what I'm gonna get at here now is this. Combination of manufacturing processes and materials that enable you to build something cheaper, easier, or could not be possible through other means. It's that last part that's most relevant. And just to kind of summarize on this particular focus, this year, FY 2008, $700 billion. Next year, over a trillion. That's the growth rate of the industry. Okay, so, whoops. So again, it's this part in yellow, not possible other means. That's where we wanna go right now. All right, and just to kind of give you a sense of where this is at in our country, um, hold on, more water, thank you. Maybe there's magnets in here, who knows. Um, the NNI was founded seven, eight years ago. Our group, amongst many others, wrote a lot of papers and did a lot of um, sort of position papers on this. And the thing that I wrote, my, my little two cents worth, or femto cents worth, who knows, um, I said, the science is not the big issue here. The science is kind of already understood. We, we know what to do about this kind of thing. It's the organization, the networks, that really matters. In other words, you have all these different disciplines, medical people, people come from all different scientific backgrounds, even people from, say, philosophical backgrounds, 
who really haven't talked to each other. They haven't really, they've been sort of like in these ivory towers, very isolated, and people who spent many years in academia will tell you that in the past, different departments were very sort of specific and territorial, kind of parochial in a way. That has to change. When I talked to Mihail Rocco personally, I said, Mihail, the number one um, test or the number one challenge is the ability to get these different sciences, different groups, different sort of opposing fractions to come together to find a common platform that they could interact with to magnify the potential of this new scientific arena. As it turns out, when Mihail Rocco actually launched the NNI, paragraph two or three of the opening statement, that's the thing they talk about. I'm not saying it was me that did this, but I'm saying a lot of other folks, I'm sure it's how the same thing. So in a way, nanotechnology is more than just building interesting things, it was also a metaphor for a new kind of social paradigm, which I think is extremely important. So it, it served multiple functions, and that's not a small thing to introduce and to magnify and to in fact reward cooperation and cross-synergy between different groups as a bona fide defined process. That was a big deal, and especially for a government bureaucracy, that's a really big deal. So this was kind of a cool thing. All right. Um, now, if I had to shrink it down to the most minimal sort of Occam's razor version of this concept, think of it like this. You got physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, kind of going through a common orifice or a portal of sorts. Out the other end comes materials, medicine, IT, energy. Those are like the four major fields. And today, especially for this audience, I would suggest, humbly, that the thing that's most relevant would be materials, which in fact enables different energy systems to be put into practice. So I'm going to sort of expand on this, what I call the three M's. Materials, methods, manufacturing. And we'll have examples of all three in sort of a, a series of, of items. But where I wanted to go next was this. Whoops, whoa, there we go. Different folks have different ways of measuring their vision of this sort of e emergent paradigm. And you can argue a little bit, but you have sort of the same general idea here. Notice how they look at self-assembly. That's an important one. And this whole idea of different kinds of uh, virtual fab labs that can mix together models of different things and then sort of test them before they actually build them. You're going to see plenty of examples of that. But to make this point really clear, other folks in other parts of the world are doing the same thing. In fact, more than we are. The number one purveyor of dollars spent per capita uh, expenditure, papers published, institutions now being financed, and new industrial projects being put in place around the world, China. They are the new engine, as far as this goes, and I really can't stress this strongly enough. In fact, um, <coughs> excuse me, more fluids. Oh, I'm sorry. Fluids are great. There's been a lot of books published. Rebecca's book is really interesting. I suggest it to everyone that wants to read. If you want to get a sense of how the world is changing and why it's changing, you might want to start with this book over here. Because everybody knows our economy is kind of, you know, taking a nosedive. And I don't want to get into too much politics, you know, 9-11 and Iraq and all this stuff, but, I mean, we could talk about it for hours, but what I'm trying to get at is, we know, we know that we're being sabotaged, that we've, we've seen a lot of really unpleasant things happen to our people. I submit to you that we could put hundreds of thousands of people back to work, literally, overnight, if we made it the national imperative to go green, have a Apollo Moon you know, program style approach to clean energy, renewable fuels, all that kind of thing, and nanotech would be a big piece of that puzzle. We could turn this around if there was the political will to do so. I cannot stress it strong enough. I will pound the table a thousand times because I truly believe this. So I am going to sort of harp on this theme as we go along. Um, so, define nanotech, now define green tech. Well, for me at least. Now, you may have different opinions, but this is what I see. Uh, renewable in terms of fuels, obviously. Efficiency, recapture of waste energy, and this is an important one. In today's world, you go into any major factory, production site, even an uh, IT system like a server farm, et cetera, there's heat everywhere. In fact, when I saw that presentation yesterday with the cooler, I was impressed. I mean, I wanted to buy one like now. And the gentleman kind of dashed off in a hurry, but I said, my friend, if you get a hold of any major computer manufacturer and you can put that system into the big server farms, the big IT installations, you, you will not, not be able to supply the market soon enough. I hope you got that message, because that, that's a big one. But there is so much waste energy out there that we can recapture, repurpose, redirect. There's an enormous amount that can be recovered. I, I, I really want to put a lot of effort into this. And the whole idea of less toxic alternatives. Um, anybody ever visit a, a fab shop where they make chips? Anybody? The, I actually, I, used, I worked in one at one point. 
imagine like a half a square mile under a roof and just rows and rows and rows of these gigantic machines, very complex machines. They grow root house of silicon, they slice it up, put on a, a platform and it runs through a series of what are called chemical mills. The chemistry is involved, the amount of water consumed, the energy it takes, it's unbelievable. Every time you go out and buy an iPhone or a new computer, whatever it is, the stuff it took to make that thing, the impact on the planet, the, the carbon footprint, the, the energy footprint, it's, if people actually knew, they'd be kind of astonished and they'd go, oh my God, what am I doing? So is there a better way to do this? I say yes, I definitely do. And lastly, this is the most important one, this thing I call on-demand manufacturing. Instead of making 10 billion of one gadget and then trying to sell them all, how about just making gadgets as you need them? There's a concept. Hmm? And in fact, if you go backwards in time, that's how most people, that's how most civilizations actually operated. It's only been the last 100 years or so that we suddenly got hooked into this huge, top-down, zillions of things all at the same time. You know, Henry Ford, you know, sort of invented this idea. It made sense to a certain point. Maybe it's gone too far. Maybe we can, in fact, go in reverse with a new kind of approach. So, um, so now just to kind of give a very rough overview, in the world of materials, there's all kinds of things. We've got wires, we've got quantum dots, we've got tubes and little dodecahedrons and tetrapods and all kinds of things. Um, this company here, Nanosys, um, Paul Elifasadis, who is a professor of chemistry emeritus at UC Berkeley, is one of the founding you know, uh, members of this group. They actually specialize in targeting different interests from different interests, industries. And the way this kind of works is, if you're looking at how an industry comes to life, the first layer is, what can you make? Can you make a new kind of something that I can make a thin film out of, or make a display out of, or make a new kind of circuit board, whatever it is. So the materials companies kind of create a series of fab processes by which they can make those materials. And then the engineers and the sort of technical folks in the next layer up, the actual product manufacturers can say, aha, I've got a new toolbox to work with. I have a new set of parameters. It's like giving a painter a larger palette with more paints on it. So in a way, you wanna, if you want to understand nanotech, you want to start with the material systems and then kind of work your way into the fab. So that's what we're doing here. Um, so. There's all kinds of different things. Um, by the way, these are, whoops, what am I doing? I have no idea. Periodic nanostructures. We have different kinds of you know, dots and so forth, interconnecting systems. And what we're gonna see next is, hopefully, uh, oops, there we go, sorry. Here. Um, how many folks have heard of self-assembly? Just the words, I don't, okay, good, good. Um, more water? I need to self-assemble fluids for myself. I don't know. Okay, so what we have here is a paradigm that says, okay, we can make little things, little crystals, little dots, little wires. Great, but what do you do with them? I mean, okay, fine. So the first most obvious would be, can you toss them onto a surface or can you throw them into a, a, an environment of some sort and have them kind of arrange themselves? Well, the answer is yes. But how is it actually done? Well, there's a variety of ways. Um, so I'm gonna show you just a couple examples. Okay, here we go. This is actually one that I'm really fond of. Imagine now if you could paint or in some way etch or bond through photonic interaction, there's always do this, some kind of chemistry that reaches up like a little hand and says if the right complementary chemistry comes along, you know, glomp onto it, hold it there. Turns out nature's really good at this. You know, viruses do this all the time, right? So can we sort of mimic that process? The answer is yes. And in fact, those are viral components assembling uh, metallic particles. That's what you see there in the corner. And here we go. Uh, another version of this kind of concept, these are called nano nails, I'm not kidding. But what they are is uh, little rods that stick up on a chip. And that you can't see the individual rods here, but you can in the expanded view. And what you have here is a way to, if you have a, a fluid, a carrier fluid, like water as an example, and you apply a current, it either balls up and has essentially no kind of uh, uh, wetness factor at all, or you can drop the current and it has complete wetness. So by changing the wetness factor, you change how a material is dis distributed on a surface. However, there's other ways to do this. Um, and you have, like I said, a variety of shapes to work with. You have tetrapods, quantum dots, all the different kinds of shapes. And where you want to go with next is, how do you actually apply a chemistry to a surface so that you can actually get these things to go somewhere interesting? Well, one method is using something called an atomic force microscope. Now, most people, I mean, how many folks have actually heard of an atomic force microscope? A couple of folks, okay. The basic idea is that 
you have a very small, like, a, like an arm that goes back and forth, like a raster line across the surface. And it bumps along. And essentially, either through direct contact or through capacitive measurements, there's a variety of ways to do this, you get a topographical feature of the actual thing you're scanning. Wonderful way to see something at the atomic scale. But what else can you do with that same tool? Besides just looking at something, can you actually deposit something? Answer is yes. So here we have, this is your ligands, by the way, uh, sort of a biological component. You can attach a, like a pen, like a little fountain pen, uh, drip onto it the actual materials that you wish. And over here in the corner, this company's called NanoInc, by the way. Over here in the corner, you see this, um, I'm sorry, you guys are here, photons. Um, you see this array. Now they have a thousand by a thousand array. That's a million AFM tips on a chip. It's a lot of dots. So now imagine if you had like a million ink pens going back and forth on a surface, going up and down, dot, dot, dot. I had an animation, but I also knew that it would be troublesome to put my animation on here, so I, I didn't put it on, but I can show you later if you want to see it. But you actually see this thing writing a surface on a chip. So now imagine if you could just write with yes and no instructions, chemistry here, chemistry not here, and then across that surface, you wash another chemistry system and you actually create something not by etching, not by some gigantic foundry, but by merely drawing the chemistry on a surface. That's a big, radical change. That's a big deal. You can actually buy a machine from NanoInc. It's about the size of this podium. It's a little bit larger like this. You put in your surface, you put in your feedstock, you paint the chemistry, and then you put in the complementary chemistries. Presto, you got a device. You can make one, or a thousand, or a million, as you need them, on demand. That's the deal here. Okay, so. Um, now, another thing to know about is something called periodic nanostructures. It's one thing to have a little wire or a little dot or a little crystal. How about if you can mix and match different materials in the same shape? That's a really big deal, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But how this is done, and I'll skip some of the more technical stuff, but the basic idea is you create what's called a sacrificial mold. Imagine I have a material of some substrate, little tiny holes, and into those holes, you sequence different materials. It could be organic, non-organic, magnetic, non-magnetic. It could be absorptive for its, you know, uh, reflective versus refractive. Any variety of materials you wish. You then strip away the mold, and you have left behind these wires or these tubes, if you will, these alternating materials. I should have a photograph over here. Here we are. This is Michael Nathan's work. He's quite famous for this. Oh, uh, more water. Sorry, guys. Here we go. If they can make like super high wetness water, like some like nano water, hey, I'd be up for it. Um, anyway, so the point is, if you can see, it's kind of hard to see this, and I apologize, but what you see in these rods, these, these are actual, they're so tiny, you can't possibly see them with the naked eye. You have to have about a 10,000 power microscope to see these. These are barcodes, and the barcodes are kind of cool because in mission critical materials like drugs, explosives, a lot of things where you want to actually track and trace what batch it was, where it went, you know, who has it. This is how you can embed that ID into the material. You can't see it with the naked eye, but you can scan for it. Now, obviously, as I'm sure many people are thinking, they're going, oh my god, that means if I buy a box of cereal, the box is going to have nanites in it. Well, no, not quite, you know, calm down. But, <laughs> but for, for very practical reasons, is there a way now to have a much tighter control on the quality of things manufactured? Because one of the big problems is when you get a bad batch of something, you have to figure out where it came from and how it was done. Well, here's a way to actually track everything that's ever been made and have it very um, tied into a very organized system of, of control. But more importantly, what else can you do with these things? Better solar cells, maybe? Or maybe a way to attach certain biomolecules and deliver it to a cell, like a cancer cell, or just you know, all kinds of things come to mind. So as a tool, you know, I'm, I'm probably the only guy here, only person here, does not actually like come in with a device or a gadget. I love watching all these devices, it's really cool. But what I'm hoping to present are a series of tools and material systems so that when you invent your next thing, you might look to these ideas to see if there's something relevant. That's the whole object of what we're doing. And to continue on, this is one of my favorites, um, something called biolithography, excuse me. Now most people who are here, I guess, are familiar with how chips are made, ordinary chips, yes or no? You grow a, a root tile of silicon, Slice up the slabs, you have these big disks, you put them on a platform, it goes through a, a series of chemistries to sort of precondition the surface. Then you apply what's called a photo mask. And a photo mask is a layer of photosensitive material upon that you project a light pattern of the circuit you want. 
that hardens up certain areas of that material where it's been exposed. And then run it through another chemical bath to wash away the leftovers, and out the other end you get this new circuit. And in fact, how you make modern chips is you have multiple layers. However, as you probably have guessed, <laughs> this is very toxic, very expensive. Um, I'll give you a little story. Uh, after I left Lawrence Laboratory, I worked at GT Lankard, the phone people. Uh, at the time, in the early 80s, this was in Palo Alto, just a few miles away from Stanford, um, there were several major foundries there, Intel and some other folks. Well, because of the EPA regulations, they all left. They moved to Mexico, actually. <laughs> it's a long story. And anyway, a friend of mine who's an environmental engineer, actually got his degree at UC Berkeley, um, co-founded a company, and they actually went out and did soil samples, where I used to work, the very spot I used to work, there's nothing there, it's a shopping center and a parking lot. 40 feet down, 40 feet into compressed clay layers, they found benzene, cadmium, all kinds of solvents, every heavy metal you could possibly not want to find. In some cases, the gas chromatography equipment was off the scale. They had to recalibrate the instrument because the densities were so high. And I'm thinking, 40 feet down, they're finding this stuff? You know, it's like, ugh. Okay, fine. What if there was a better way? I'm just offering the idea. So, a better way could be using the same exact photolithography process, but instead of chemically etching surfaces of silicon, what if you could deposit molecules? What a concept, hmm? So, here we are. And in fact, the company did this. They were called BSI. They came out of Michigan, which is a big biotech state. Now it's called Cermotics. And this is the fun part. As inventors, you might appreciate this. Um, their target goal wasn't circuits at all. It was um, making implants, you know, hip implants and other kinds of implants. They had to come up with a way to be able to create surfaces that were biocompatible to the tissue of interest. So they invented a very clever chemistry. This is a phototrophically driven resin. It's a biological material that when light is shined upon it, it could be a laser light, these little cylinders or these little rods form little like dendrites at the end of them, like little chemical hands. And then, because of the chemistry involved, they could attach lipids, enzymes, peptides, DNA, RNA, whole cells, whatever. They became very adept at this idea of a phototropically driven biolithography process. Well, I read that paper, or the first paper published in 91, I believe. I said, hey, wait a minute, forget implants. I can make a chip with this. This is cool. Well, a lot of other folks had the same idea. So now, as we speak, Intel and a few other folks, I won't mention, they're doing as we speak. And somewhere in the future, your chip may or may not have some mix between biology and ordinary silicon and other things. But I just want to give you like an advanced view. So again, if you're trying to invent something and you need to have a very complex or interesting pattern of molecules or materials, there are other ways to get at this target goal besides the usual methods. This is one of them. Okay, so, um, hello? Yes. Now, once you've got this kind of method going on, more fluids, my apologies, just going on here, but I need an IV with fluids, that's what I need. Anyway, um, now you have the ability to take small particles, gold in this case, but any material you wish, coat them with a complementary chemistry, get them so they can hook up together, make a pattern of some sort. So what's the next step? What's the next thing to do? Well, how about this? This is from Mike Heller, a guy I've known for many, many years, a great friend. He started a company called Nanogen. They're quite famous now. This was in UC San Diego, where he was a professor for many years, and now he's started his own company. But what they have, and I'm sorry, it's hard to see in the cartoons, a little bit of a fuzzy diagram, but the basic idea is you have a chip, like a little integrated circuit, about the size of this button here, and you have little tiny sites. Each site is electrically addressable, so that you can say yes or no, to either attract or repel the particles in question. And those particles can then have complementary chemistries attached to the surface. So now you have a great series of handles. You have materials, matching chemistries, and a chip that you can address on a dot-by-dot -dot basis to say, put a chemical here or a molecule here. Don't put one there. Just like programming EEPROM, any guys that program Chips out here know about this. It's like typing in code for EEPROM, only here you type in code for a nano assembler chip, yes? You can buy this instrument today. It's about $10,000, but if you want to have one that's on your desk, there you are. So I, I really wanted to get across that this is not future. This is stuff you can actually go into a lab. And, and by the way, I'm not in, I have no money involved in this. I'm not selling anything. I'm not pushing any kind of product. I'm just saying these are things that I know about. Um, okay, so. Um, 
in my little world, in my nano world, to me, again, it's not so much how little is the thing. That's kind of missing the point. But what is interesting is how these things can be mixed together at different scales. So in my humble opinion, when you can mix and match different material systems to accommodate some larger design strategy, that's where the real epicenter of value is. And so these are just a couple of charts from various publications that sort of look at this. Um, but other parts of the world are also looking at this, as I tried to suggest to you earlier. So even if it's not 6 o'clock news here, trust me in this one. You go to Korea, Japan, anywhere in China, Russia, I mean all over Northern Europe, people are getting it. Believe me, they are. Okay. So, um, again, I can't make this point strong enough. It's this intersection between the nano, micro, and sort of meso stage of scales of interaction, where you want to be able to deposit or interact with or sort of grow, if you will, different components to make a larger system of some kind come to life. Um, this, by the way, is kind of cool. This is a atomic force microscopy picture of a gold crystal. These are individual atoms, these little, little dots here. These are actual individual atoms, and it's embedded into a protein substrate. Now, anybody want to guess why he would want to put gold crystals into a protein substrate? That's like a trick question, but you'll have the answer in just a few moments. Just want to, you know, like a game show, TV game show. Okay, fine. Name that molecule, right? So here we go. Um, but again, just to get this point across, I'm kind of big on repeating things to get the point more clearly understood. I was having a discussion a couple of days ago about DNA as a sensor, and I won't say who, and I won't say what the application was. It may be private, but let's just say we had that discussion. So notice over here, what do you suppose is going on there? You see a carbon nanotube, maybe, yes, and you see something going on inside there? I wonder what that is. I'll tell you in just a minute. But in the meantime, um, notice all these different shapes. Look at these things. These are naturally occurring shapes. What if you could mix and match some that nature creates and some that we create to make a complex system to accommodate our interests, but do so like in a desktop gadget with very, very little energy, something you could run off your you know, tabletop, as it were? Well, I'll show some examples. But first, but first, just to review. This is your typical fab. I've been to many of them. I worked in one at one point. I don't even want to know what chemistries I breathed in. <laughs> if I die tomorrow, it's probably from the stuff I was exposed to 20 years ago when I was in a place like this. But if you ever go to a fab, I mean, it's just the extreme outer frontiers of extreme restrictions, class 10,000 clean rooms, unbelievably poisonous chemicals. Believe me, unless you're being paid a lot of money, you don't want to be in these places. Compared to this, this is Angela Belcher, very famous lady, very smart lady. I really respect her a lot. She was kind of a pioneer. When she suggested using living things as a foundry, back when she was at Texas A&M, Texas, um, well, people, I wouldn't say they laughed at her, but they said, oh, come on. But then other folks started taking a look. She was courted by and eventually wooed into MIT, not known for frivolous ideas. Hmm? So if MIT was going to support her work, well, it might mean something interesting. So she eventually founded a company called Cambrios. There it is. And their whole mission is to grow in a dish. I mean, it's kind of a metaphor, but notice, notice her lab. Microscope, Petri dish, right? As opposed to this. Anybody sort of see the difference there? So I'm suggesting, just as an idea, maybe this is a better way to go. I, whoops, oh, whoa, 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 right down. Okay, nice machine, nice machine. We'll buy you a new disc later, okay, fine, thanks. Okay, so um, here's where I'm gonna go. More water. I feel like one of those plants. Maybe I need some uh, magnetic materials, I don't know. Okay, here we go. In my humble opinion, what you're looking for are properties. Photonic, electronic, mechanical, chemical, those are the four major fields. And into a hopper, you go biomolecular processes. At the other end, you have this, this sort of bifurcation. There's like two basic areas. Either dynamic agent, here like this, where you have a living thing that actually moves around, it grows, it, it crawls across the surface, it interacts, it, 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 it consumes and excretes. By the way, I should point this out. There's something called bioremediation. This is a really cool idea. Um, all over, I've traveled quite a bit, and I've been to some areas of the world where poverty is, hard, it's, is hideous, it's, it's crushing. We saw some shots a couple days ago of a starving kid in Biafra and you know, that kind of thing. 
I've seen this kind of stuff, it, it rips your heart out. But one of the things that really, really rips your heart out is some of these big companies have decided, for whatever reason, they can guess, to go to some of these really poor countries and dump their waste there. You know, they'll bribe the local chief or the local whoever and say, you know, dumber stuff there. Piles and piles of circuit boards and just, you know, gelatinous mass of chemical sludge, these gigantic unwind, you know, holes. It's, it's, it's beyond horrible, it's evil. So is there a way to save this? Well, maybe. What if, just what if, you could take a microbe, a new kind of artificially derived microbe, that could go in there and actually digest, eat, if you will, these chemicals or these materials, metals in some cases. And then you can harvest those critters. And through a very simple, non-toxic sort of enzymic action, you know, kill off the critters and harvest those metals back out of the sludge pond. How interesting it would be. How, since the gentleman before him was talking about rhodium and indium, which I know quite well, by the way, how interesting it would be if these poor people who were taken advantage of by these, you know, evil whatevers that decided to dump their stuff right there, actually turned around and began selling their sludge at a profit back to the rest of the world. I think that's kind of cool. And what if you could do it with a nanobiological solution? I love it. And so one of my friends at Burke is actually doing this as we speak. I mean, you know, these are, it's like justice in the world sometimes. Okay, so anyway, enough of that, but just to get this idea across, so one half of this goes into the dynamic area, the other one goes into something called controlled replication. Can everybody see this okay? And the idea is that a, a living cell is like a piece of machinery. If you open up a cell, what do you find? You find ribosomes, proteasomes, mitochondria, all these little machines called organelles. What the organelles do is they are uh, spoken to by what's called messenger proteins. And these messenger proteins are constantly communicating back and forth. Like little machines, they sort of break apart, reassemble molecules to address the physiological interest of the cell and the larger organism. That sounds like nanotech to me, hmm? I, you know? So I wonder if we can do something interesting with that. Answer is yes. Here we go, okay. Um, for anybody who's ever worked in optics, there's something called photonic band gap materials. I'll repeat that again. Photonic band gap materials. Excuse me. And what that means is, if you have many frequencies of light, and you want to be able to separate out certain frequencies for a switch, or for a computing application, perhaps, or to maybe make something more efficient in a certain way of light, you know, that kind of thing. Well, to actually make one through traditional foundry means is really expensive and hard and just not a good thing. However, nature grows them in a seashell. Hmm. Any ideas? Maybe? Yes? So, um, now, one thought that comes to mind, how about if you had bacteriophages, little viruses that grow inside of bacteria, and you were able to genetically trick the bacteria to have certain, or the viruses rather, to have certain uh, hooks, chemical hooks, that would be receptive to certain materials. What if you could then grow them on a, on a surface, like a dish or, or a platinum, and then they would make a kind of a pattern wash away the organics, put on another layer, another layer, etc., and make this kind of a sandwich of sorts. What if you could actually do that? Well, guess what? Oh, oh by the way, before I get there, this, by the way, is one of Angie's uh, experiments. This is, anybody want to guess what this is? This is a TV game show, name that thing, right? These, this is gold, thank you very much. Remember the gold and the proteomic material? Well, this is gold grown as a thin film. Extremely interesting when you're doing sensors, or maybe fuel cells, maybe. Mm -hmm. And to manufacture something like this, very expensive, cumbersome, big fab, here was grown in a dish. Sounds kind of interesting, don't you think? So again, going back to photonic band gap materials, this is a computer rendering of a theoretical band. Nobody can make this. This is an unmakeable thing. Mathematically, as a computer model, we can simulate what it should do with light, but we can't make one. However, nature has grown one. Hmm, I wonder, I just wonder. So, hold on one more sec. Sorry about this. Yeah, okay, it's alive, it's alive, ah! Could be a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. Oh my God. And by the way, Catherine, who's part of our film crew, she fed me this beautiful, concoction with all these mystery powders and juices and everything. She's a real wizard. You should talk to her about her stuff because 
she does a lot of work in like health drinks and some products and some stem cell stuff she's working on. I mean, I was dead this morning and I drank a cup of her stuff. I was like, wow, I'm ready for anything. So I'm living proof this stuff works. Anyway, so back to the talk. Um, this was actually at Livermore Lab, this thing over here. They um, tried to make what's called log pile. If you, I'm not kidding, if you do a web search on log pile and photonic band gap materials, you'll get that. Um, this was very, very painful. A handful of folks and some uh, very uh, specialized equipment could sort of make one of these things, but you know. So the theory was to make this. Well, you might make one or maybe two over a course of you know, several days, but never gonna manufacture them. However, 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 if you have biology on your side, you might be able to just grow one of those by the millions with almost no energy at all. Hmm, I wonder, okay? So, again, just to not spend too much time on photonics, but I mean, for those folks that work in optics like I have in the past, this is like a big deal, this is really cool. So the idea is to be able to select different sort of regions, have them either refract or reflect, and do so in a very precise way. And that buys you big, 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 big advantage in optical computing, and by the way, um, in the film 2001 Space Odyssey, remember at the very end when the, um, I forget his name now, the character was inside the computer and he was unscrewing the little memory and his lucite blocks came out? Well, what they were trying to show us that optical computing is the new thing. They're right. Stanley Kubrick was only, I don't know, 30 years ahead of his time, but he had the right idea because the next big thing is going to be optical computing. If you think when you go to a store now and you buy a 5 gigahertz, whatever it is, and you got a chip in there with you know, cooling and all this stuff. If you have photons, there is no cooling. And now you start to work in the terahertz region. Terahertz, forget giga, giga is so yesterday, blah. Terahertz, and how do you get there? With this. And how do you make one of those? With a seashell. Hmm, interesting, okay. So again, just to kind of get this point across. Can you grow something as opposed to manufacture something using a kind of a nano approach? Yes, you can. Okay, so, uh, by the way, speaking of God's creations, I like little things. I just do, I don't know why. I, as a kid, I was always interested in like little tiny things. I just, I don't know why. But now, look at this. Look at these beautiful creatures. You know, the best geneticist on the planet would die to be able to grow that as an artificial object. You go in the ocean, billions of these things, like snowflakes. What a spectacular thing. Look at this, beautiful crystals. If we just be able to type into a computer a formula and say, grow that. Now, is that being God? Well, I'm not sure. But as I said in the beginning of this talk, we, at the, we were at the edge of being able to sort of redefine what life is. Should we use this? Are we allowed to do this? I say yes, if we do it for the right reasons. That's the test, it's not the stuff, it's how you apply your free will to apply the stuff that matters. That's my opi personal opinion. Whoops, oh, wrong button, sorry. There we go. So, uh, but, so the next sort of thing down the pike is this, DNA. DNA is the most sophisticated molecule that we know of in all of the universe. We may find something better in the future, but this is, this is it, it's top of the pyramid. A base four numbering system, highly complex, the amount of different things you can do with DNA is astonishing. It conducts, it can be both photonically, electrically interesting, it can be used in sensors, but much more importantly, a structural system. Now think about this for a minute. I mean, here you've got the biggest, most complex fast on the planet, and all it can do is make little lines and a piece of silicon, but look at what this does. I mean, that's pretty cool, okay? So, Dead Seaman, who I've met many times, he's from NYU, um, he went from this to this, and how did he do that? He figured out a very clever way to be able to recognize that different proteins would fold at different, um, how to say this correctly, different bond, um, binding site geometries, would allow the proteins to fold in alternate directions. And there's some secret sauce I won't go into, but they worked out a scheme that works really well. So what they ended up with is this. Um, a lot of, a number of folks I'm sure have seen Logic diagrams, you know, where you have ands and ors and ors and all that kind of thing. Well, this is like a proteomic version of that. Okay? So now imagine for a minute. Instead of a giant foundry, you've got something you can't even see. The very stuff that 
if you wish, you know, God gave us inside of ourselves, can now grow this. Why is that relevant? Because you could do things you cannot possibly do any other way. Remember at the very beginning of the talk, I said things that could not be done through other means? So here we are. These are DNA strands with, oh, sorry, with conductive gold crystals in between in three dimensions. See anything interesting there? Well, I do. Imagine, well, okay, a couple of things. How many folks know about the, um, the DARPA Challenge Project where they had the smart vehicles? And four years, yeah, okay, great. And friends of mine at Stanford were part of that project. Um, the first time they tried, the, the, the idea was they had a whole bunch of uh, companies and, and universities competing to see who could make a, a vehicle that could drive itself across a, a 10 mile long terrain. First time I tried it, nothing worked. Everything failed. One machine got like, I think, 50 yards. A year later, more than half the machines completed the course. And they made the course much more complex. Going through streets, around corners, stopping at lights, going over tunnels, over, through, over bridges and through tunnels. How'd they get there? How'd that happen so fast? What was the mechanism? I have an answer. Among the things that were done, one of those. <laughs> I'm telling you. Thank you for water. Um, a company right here in New Mexico, by the way, called Noma Tech with an M. They built, or I should say, they grew a DNA-based component system, a self-evolving neural network that was part of the brain of the machine that won. That was two years ago. So, when you see this stuff as a diagram, it's not even a diagram, it's already like a, a doable thing. So, um, now there's another area that I'm really fond of called astrobiology. And astrobiology is the science, or some people call it exobiology, is the science of looking for unusual life forms as a way to understand the parameters of where life could or could not be. If we're gonna go to Mars, for instance, and look for things that might be, have been growing there, well, we wanna know a little bit more about what exactly are the conditions for life and so on. Well, it turns out that if you walk around this planet, you can find bubbling mud pits, pH of two, eight degrees Celsius. I mean, nothing could possibly be alive in there. Wrong answer. Microbes flourishing in there. These little protein rings come from a kind of micro that lives in just that environment. Now, why is this interesting? Because not only have these life forms invented a very unusual way to survive in that climate and, and thrive, but they create interesting structures as a byproduct of that process. So Jonathan Trent, who was never a material science guy, but was a geneticist who discovered these protein rings after they collected their specimens from this uh, bubbling mud pit, said, you know what? That's kind of cool stuff. I wonder if we can do something interesting with it. So once again, remember our little gold crystals? So another group of folks came along and said, we got gold crystals. What if we were able to chemically bind those gold crystals to these little ringlets and then wash away the ringlets and have a very beautiful, very perfect pattern of gold crystals as conductor sites on an infinitely scalable surface? With no foundry, a Petri dish. What a concept. They did this three years ago. So, I just wanna make that point. And here's another example. Uh, these are ligands with lipid. Uh, these little triangles are called lipids, these little structures here. Ligands are these long sort of accordion-like molecules that are very common in nature. And they're very handy for attaching things. They're like little alligator clips. And then at the end, we have these little lipids, which are then like little uh, collector sites for attaching other molecules. So there's different ways to get the same end goal. But where I wanted to go to was this. This is an actual AFM photograph of this very structure. So again, just to review before we go to the next square. These are the, like the five bullet points, like Dave Letterman's top five or something. Um, printable chemistries, self-assembly, integrated two and 3D systems, genetic modification of biological materials, and most importantly, the one that I'm really big on, this guy down here, this whole idea of living systems as a biofoundry. That's big news. So, we can continue. As I was saying before, a living cell is like a machine. It is the ultimate, most powerful machine on this planet. We humans think we're big stuff because we can build big tractors or something. <laughs> You're kidding. That is a miracle because we are just beginning to figure out how to actually do this. 
Now, in a very interesting kind of way, by the way, there's a guy by the name of Leroy Hood. He's quite famous up in the Northwest, uh, up in Seattle, actually. Um, and there's something called systems biology. Systems biology is a, a, a new approach, really. It's a holographic way of looking at biological systems. Oh my gosh, I'm being told I'm about to be yanked off the stage. So, I better hurry up. Okay, fine. So, <laughs> we'll speed along here. Um, this is like a schematic diagram of the concept. You have uh, detectors that detect different materials. You feed them through a rules-based system. Out the other end comes these new materials. Um, whoops, hold on. In the real world, there's something called in silica biology. This is from a company called Pangea Computing, and they sort of developed these very high-end supercomputers. This is a real thing. This is an actual model of a living system. And I do not have time now to explain what these all are, but trust me, this is, a, this is a living cell, like what you saw a couple of slides ago, only this is the computer model of a living cell. This is a big deal to be able to do this. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip through this because it's probably redundant because I know I'm going to get tossed off. This is, by the way, this is Lawrence Laboratory's approach to an object-oriented genetic system for growing materials and systems. And I can certainly answer questions after I'm done. I'll be very glad to go into more detail. Whoops, hello? Yes. And it's a fun one. This is Sandia Labs right here in New Mexico. Their ambition was to be able to use a living system to make platinum, um, a few atoms of platinum, make a kind of a spherical structure. Platinum is very expensive, so is palladium. It was the two most important catalysts that we have for a lot of our different material processes. If you can take a few atoms of platinum and replace, you know, many more atoms of platinum to get the same performance, that's a big win. So here we have a living system to actually create little spheroids. You have atoms of platinum at key points, and you've now invented a new way to create catalysis because what you want is this. More water. Hold on. Okay. Um, distribution, spatial distribution, and the actual uh, surface area for, versus volume. These are all the rules you want to play with. And so if you have a new way of creating structures, and you can use a lot smaller amounts of the crucial material in question, now you have this as a new handle. Okay, and I'm going to skip this. This is the different kinds of molecules that are available. Now, you know, speaking of John, when we first got together, he had this giant toolbox. I mean, I was impressed. There was tools all over the place. We drove all over town getting drills and all this wild stuff. I'm going, oh my God, they're just doing camera work. It can't possibly be this complex, but you know. So in my world, just like John's toolbox, I have a toolbox, but it's much smaller tools. But I see this the same way, you know, little hammers and saws and drills, but the same exact concept, but at a molecule scale. So. Um, I'm so sorry, I've got to skip through some of this. This is something I'm really fond of. This is a way to store hydrogen as a solid state medium. As we heard in yesterday's talk, hydrogen is very interesting, but can you do something better than just cram it into a giant tank? I say yes, this is a metallically doped carbon nanotube. Uh, I won't go into the chemistry right now, but it's a way to get hydrogen to latch onto the tube and pack it up, and then you can pull it out with a very small amount of energy. Um, lots of other ways you can do this capacitors, transistors, and so on. Um, this is cool. This is a graphene quantum dot. Instead of having to make a dot, you just have a little tiny, like, eight atoms of carbon can make a, a, quant a graphene quantum dot. Um, okay, this is important. Um, folks have asked me, in fact, one person in particular said, Charles, how am I going to get DNA to make a perfectly straight line across a chip surface and have it repeatable for a large area? And I said, remember this word, nanoimprinting. printing. And he goes, what? Well, I said, nano printing. Well, here we are. What this is, imagine you take a, a mold and you sort of press it down to a material and you run it through a certain process and then you're able to pull the mold back away. That's exactly what you have here. But look at the size. Whoops, sorry, wrong, wrong gadget. Um, 70 nanometers. That's really small. Over here we have a lens, a Fresnel lens, right? But a really small one. I mean, these are tools, just like, just like John's toolbox, only on a much smaller scale. Uh, more examples of imprinting, but I want to skip that for now. So here's some examples of chemistries. Um, lead solenoid, lithium niobate, for anyone's ever done optical computing, they'll know what that means. Now to make nanocrystals of this stuff, it's cool because now instead of having to grow a big crystal, lots of little ones, line them up in a perfect pattern, you've now skipped 90% of the cost, we still have all the function. Okay. Uh, whoops, wrong direction, sorry, here we go, one more time. So I'm, gonna skip, I'm just going to show you some photographs. We're kind of running out of time, so I'm just going to go by some of the stuff. These are different examples. By the way, these are cobalt atoms in a self-assembled uh, magnetic quantum dot. That's another fun area. 
these are nano diamonds. These are really cool. Um, anyway, okay, here we go. This is the work of James Torr, University of Michigan. His idea was to use ligands as these components, like he calls them alligator clips. He got really big attention several years ago. Then Darwin came along and said, hey, we like this. We like it a lot. Come work for us. So he left academia, and now he's working for DARPA. But again, the whole idea is you can actually grow a circuit as opposed to having to catch one. Um, let me go on. Computing, uh, Accelerus manufactures a very nice package. It's like CAD for molecules. You can simulate the molecule's performance. But here's where I'm going to go. Quantum modeling is a really complicated thing. It's one thing to show a picture of atoms, but it's another thing to actually have the atoms perform some complex function and be able to mimic their behavior. A quantum model of 10,000 atoms is a big deal. A quantum model of 100,000 atoms, that's like way out there in the fringe. However, if you have the right company in mind, they can do this, here they are. Excuse me. Nanostellar went public about two years ago. Again, catalysis, little dodecahedron right here. Individual platinum or palladium atoms. That molecule can do exactly the same thing that a solid crystal of platinum or palladium could do in the past but at one one hundredth or one one thousandth of the cost. So, continue on. Um, okay, let's get that. Quantum dots. Um, quantum dots are cool because what they do is they're little tiny pieces of um, semiconductor material, cadmium, germanium, selenium, et cetera, which they give you a broad spectrum of light and out the other end comes just one frequency, but the same, relatively the same amplitude or, or signal strength. So examine, or exam, imagine for a minute, a solar material, solar voltaic material. Now you have silicon, hold on one sec. Silicon has an efficiency of about 10% under best conditions. Galling marcinite, maybe about 12 to 15. There are organics that you can paint on, like a paint, or a laminate through a roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing process. They're around 2 or 3%, but they're very inexpensive. You can actually wear a jacket made out of this material. In fact, I'll show you pictures in a minute. Uh, the military is now making tents where the cloth that attend is actually a, a solar collector. I mean, it's unbelievable. But it's kind of low efficiency. Can you improve the efficiency? Yes, you can by attaching these things to the surface. So, um, quantum dots. There's lots of books published. I know I'm going to get thrown off stage in just a minute. I want to go past all this. Get to the next. Uh, these are these, by the way, are quantum dot tetrapods, and these are interesting because if you have a, a large surface and you just throw them on the surface, and they land with three feet down, there's always going to be one leg sticking up. So there's no assembly required. They self-organize into this perfect layer of material. Okay, continue on. How much time? Two minutes? One minute? <laughs> there's a big cane coming out now. You can yank me off the stage. Or <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I want to skip a few of these. Then I'm going to have to skip some chemistry. But like I said, I'd be very happy to um, go into this much more detail. I do apologize if it took too long. Um, okay, there's, there's like a couple of important points here I want to get to. Oh, Charles, by the way, make it this three. Is, um, this is cool. Imagine if you're walking around, and just the action of your walking, your shoes hitting the ground, could generate electricity. That's what that does. Okay, okay, hold on, keep going, keep going. That's Hanji Dai's work at Stanford. I can't go into it right now, but we'll continue. Uh, more nanowires. This is the uh, world's smallest LED. This is one molecule emitting light. Uh, quantum dots. That's a carbon nanofiber that's woven into a wearable garment. This is actually an ultra capacitor. Imagine now if you're a lady, late at night, some questionable character, looking like me, guy with a beard, walks up and says, hey, baby, you went around. And you turn on your jacket, and he goes, and he, you know, I'm serious. <laughs> you can buy this, OK? OK. So now, um, I, and don't throw me off quite the stage quite yet, please. I, I beg for you. Um, this is important. A lot of folks here are making motors and magnetic systems, and it's all wonderful. I love it. It's beautiful. It's my kind of stuff. But there's something to be sort of learned here, I think. Superconductivity does not have to be cryogenically cooled in a vat of liquid helium. I built these things myself, I should know. We used to have niobium wires, very thin, uh, with sputtered titanium around them made these big bobbins and dip it into a 55-gallon drum-sized thing of liquid helium. They would work for a few minutes and then die, you know, <laughs> that's the old days. How about this? Room temperature. Room temperature, okay? This company is called uh, American Superconductor. Go to their website. It's expensive, but if you're trying to make a 
over Unity device of some kind involving some coils and so on, uh, well, you know, just have a look at this. Might be interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna skip past this. Oh, wireless, this is Tesla. Tesla talked about wireless power, right? Hmm? There you are, nano antennae, wireless power. That's the real thing. This is actually a Japanese development. You'll see it in the market soon. And before you throw me off, um, this is the thing I wanted to talk about. This is really interesting. Superconductive polymers. These little dots you see here in the corner. Imagine now uh, polymers, which are these long spaghetti-like molecules, and they sort of interconnect and cross overlap. Where they cross overlap, they have these intersecting valence sites. Inside those valence sites, there are these pockets, these little vestibules, called superpolarons. Inside the superpolaron, it's like a cloud of electrons just swarming about. No specific valence. Why is that cool? Here's why. Charles, I want to ask you a quick question. Yes, please. You know, Charles has a few more slides that are very interesting and very intriguing. And if we can uh, uh, have his Q&A session outside, and if you're all comfortable with it, uh, he, he probably could use about another five to eight minutes or ten minutes. And if everybody feels comfortable with it, we'll bump the schedule back, say, another ten minutes. And that means that the next speaker will start in 20 minutes because uh, we'll take a 10-minute break there, and the GEET session will start at like 1.45. How many people are, are okay with that so we let Charles finish his? Charles, why don't you keep going? Thank, thank you, you so sir. Much. Thank you, and thank you, audience. This is good. Thank you. Okay, cool. We're cruising. Okay. And more water. This is good. Life is good. Thank you. Okay. So, on that note, I get excited about this stuff because I spent many years, I'm going to tell you a true story. This is a true story. In 1981-82, after Carter was voted out of office and Reagan came in, and we tried, I mean, we really, really tried to talk to the right people about our energy policy. How many folks know about a book called The Global Chessboard by Zygmunt Zabrensky? Yes, no, maybe, okay. In that book, he was, this was, I mean, I have a lot of respect for Jimmy Carter. Maybe some folks might argue this, but I do. Zygmunt Zabrensky wrote this book called the Global Chessboard, and in it he said in very clear terms, if we did not change our energy policy back in the 70s and begin to take on a nationwide imperative to get out of Middle Eastern oil and out of this whole sort of monolithic oil and so on, we'd be forced into a global war with Islam within 30 years. And he gave a very precise roadmap of exactly where, including Iraq, this is actually a map of Iraq in there. They wouldn't listen, they just had their own agenda. Fine, okay, lovely. So. They sent me off to uh, Los Alamos, and I worked on Star Wars for a while. Um, and that was okay, I, there was a reason for it. We were trying to tell the Russians, stop building bigger rockets, because we're gonna shoot them down. But when I was at Los Alamos, I was in, a, in this room, they had a special room where we were allowed to go in, I had a Q clearance badge and the whole thing. And stuff would come in, we'd build a circuit, and they would go back out, we never saw where it went. Okay, but one day, we were, we were allowed to sort of see what we were building, and I saw this laser called Antares. Now, imagine something, as big as this room, but like many, many floors underground, with giant beam guides going up. Everybody remember the first Star Wars film when they saw the Death Star? Well, this was kind of like that. We didn't blow up planets, but believe me, this was a big, big, big piece of machinery. The power supply was as big as this whole building. I mean, it was unbelievable. Our goal was to create femtosecond pulses of light that could target multiple reentry vehicle warheads called MIRVs. And I remember very clearly sitting next to one of my tech guys, and we were saying, you know, someday if we ever got to meet our Russian counterparts, because, you know, it occurred to me, they had these beautiful technologies, very smart people, most of them were very family-oriented, very life-oriented, and nobody wanted to kill anybody. We just were trying to do our job and defend the world, really. And I thought, I wonder if the Russians feel the same way. I just wonder. 25 years later, I'm in Virginia giving a talk to this Virginia energy technology sort of group, talking about nanotech and energy, you know, nanoscale and coal particles, all that kind of stuff. And out of the audience comes a guy who says, hi, I'm working with something called the IPP, or Initiative for Proliferation Prevention. You can look it up on the web yourself. And I said, well, I don't know, talk to me. He says, well, it's a bunch of Russians, and I'm going, oh yeah, because I knew a bunch of Russians at the time. And this was via Vladimir Putin's personal authority and our State Department and Department of Energy all shook hands and said, you know what, we want to create a kind of a, uh, exchange where your former military scientists, your you know, Q clearance type guys from the Russian side can come here 
and expose the technology and have Western um, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, opportunity and be steered towards peaceful applications. Next year, I was in Philadelphia, giant trade show, 10,000 people, all kinds of things going on. I'm on the floor working for a group called Fourth Venture, a VC group, and they were shopping for IPP-related projects. I found one, a beautiful windmill. Like, everybody see a Daedalus windmill, these like egg beater type things? The Russians made a beautiful one, really different, very, very spectacular design. I met the guys who invented it. The guys I met and shook hands with and looked square in the eye were the principal designers for the MERV warheads that we were aiming our lasers at. I'm not kidding. This was, this was, like, this was like, like God. I mean, this is like religion. It was like I had just thought this idea out of you know, thin vapor 25 years later. It's like I'm actually shaking hands with those very guys. And even though we couldn't speak each other, they had interpreters and everything. They had kids, families, same exact thought. We don't want to kill anybody either. Is there something else we can do? This is the result of one of those projects. This is cool. This is a superconductive polymer. Excuse me, more water. Hold on. Um, there we go. Mm. Oh, that's great. Okay, room temperature. That's the important part. So, imagine now you have a layer of this rubbery-like material. Every so often you have these little vertical dots, like, I'm sorry I can't draw something on the board, but like these vertical channels called superpolarons. The superpolarons are interesting because you have these intersecting valence sites. A swarm of, imagine like a swarm of bees just buzzing around. So an electron comes in on top, bounces around, comes out the other end, but it falls through. Does not have to commit itself to a given valence, it just tumbles on through. It is a superconductor. Now, you go to a traditional superconducting physics meeting, you'll get left out of the room, unless you show them a physical specimen of this. The deal was, they could grow these sites, but we didn't know how to grow them in precise patterns. The company I was working with called Quantum Polymer, they, got, they lost their funding, it's a complicated story. Another group called MPI Magnetic, oh, next slide, sorry, hold on, these guys right here. Whoops, wrong direction, where am I going? I'm right here, nope, where am I done? I screwed it completely, whoops, okay, let's try this again. Uh, I think I might be missing a slide, okay, the heck with it. Hold on, one more time. Okay, well, I'm missing a slide, but it is. It's a company called MPI, Magnetic Power Incorporated, they sort of took over the project, and now they actually have this stuff that they can like spread on a dish, and I have a theory about how to do this, but the whole point is, we believe that we can actually now make a ordered series of these little superconducting sites. Now imagine, just imagine, if you had a polymer, you could actually paint into a surface that could superconduct if it was set up the right way. Just, I just let your, you're the inventors, you think about that for a while, okay? So we're gonna go on. Um, these, this, by the way, this is a rare earth magnets made into these little toroids. I'm sure you can figure out something interesting to do with that. Um, okay, more examples, those are cobalt atoms. This is all cobalt and magnetite over here. Uh, okay, this is cool. What do you think you're looking at? Want to guess? Ever hear of fluid magnetics? This is cool stuff. I mean, I saw this for the first time myself a couple years ago. This is like way cool. Okay, so here we go. Uh, what you got here are little nanomagnetic particles, and they have a, a sort of a structure, like a little dendrite structure around the outside, and they sort of hook up together. But um, essentially what happens is you have a fluid, it's kind of viscous, like, like honey, but if you pump a magnetic field through it, you will get magnetic structures. And so I ask you, as inventors, see anything interesting? Magnetic structures, fluids? Hmm? I'm just offering an idea. You can figure out your own inventions. So uh, I know we're running out of time. RF things, lovely ideas, but let's go further. How about this? A single nanotube radio, UC Berkeley. One molecule as an RF device. Anything interesting? Okay, remember tubes? When I was 14 years old, I built my own oscilloscope from scratch. I mean, literally, I bought a book and opened up it and then built a circuit with tubes. I'm old enough to remember those days. But tubes haven't died yet. Now, a lot of musicians out here, I've actually got a trainer amplifier head at home with four 6550 power pentodes in it, these big tubes. They glow purple and I play my bass and it's like, yeah. But what else can you do with tubes? I'll show you. Oh, by the way, for anyone that wants to build a Tesla coil, this guy here over here is really cool. This is an 833A power triode thyristor. 
They're made in Russia from a place called Svetland. I can never pronounce it right. They make the best tubes in the world. They're expensive, but if you want a power triode thyristor to drive a giant, you know, a really big Tesla coil, that's your gadget. But what if you could make a really small one like that? Hmm. An array of triodes. Now, why are tubes cool? Tubes are cool because you actually have a, a vacuum, not a semiconductor. We have to like push, you know, holes one way, electrons the other way. No, we have a vacuum. So it's just flying through the vacuum. They're called valves in other parts of the world. So here you have a microarray of nano valves. Anything interesting going on? Just an idea. Okay, so to continue, um, this is really where things are going. I mentioned terahertz. I wasn't kidding. That's where things are going. Uh, optical computing, right around the corner. I'll show you something else. Uh, I'm going to skip this for now. I, I'll explain later in detail if you wish. But where I wanted to go to was this. Whoops. Well, anyway, this is the different terahertz domains that we're currently working with. I'm going to skip that for now. This is where I want to go. Um, hold on one more time. We've heard a lot about quantum mechanics and quantum interaction. And this idea that you could take, for instance, a photon, split it in half, have it go down miles of fiber. One half photon is bent, the other one bends with it. What's going on there? They're not attached physically. They're miles apart. I wonder what's going on there. Other dimensions? Hmm, maybe so. Well, let's see. Stephen Hawkins, Michu Kaku, the top physicists on the planet, and in fact, John's dad was talking about Stephen Hawkins a couple days ago. You know, these are like the smartest guys on the planet. They talk about 11 dimensions, quantum entanglement, things that we can't see, but we can prove they exist. Now, for those folks who doubt this idea, okay, that's fine, but Hold that thought. This company called Magic Technologies, they talked at my conference that I held at NASA three years ago. What are you looking at? This is a quantum encryption device. This is a NSA approved level five crypto device. Top of the line. All of our military now use this. This came from Los Alamos lab in this very state. This is where the experiment was done. And what happens? You have packets of photons separated by infinite lengths, if you will. Encrypted into these photons is a series of what I might call photonic rotations, and some of it's classified, so I'm not going to explain exactly what goes on, but roughly that's the idea. If the NSA and the Department of the Navy, Air Force, Army, and all of our top agencies now approve this as their top of the line security uh, interface for encrypted messages using quantum entanglement with photons. Gee, I kind of suggest this probably works. Maybe, possibly, hmm? So we've been hearing a lot of stuff about zero point energy and other dimensions and everybody's saying, oh, that stuff can't work, it's all craziness. Well, wait a minute, if you can buy this box using those principles, I wonder, I'll leave that, you can decide for yourself. Okay, fine. So, uh, <laughs> going right along here. Um, this is another important topic. I don't know how much time I'm allowed, but I'll just continue on. Um, the other big thing that I'm really bent on is, tra is transmutation. This whole idea of being able to convert elements. Now, people have been talking about alchemy, and um, Roth was speaking about this earlier, and all these other folks have been talking about alchemy for years. Now, actually, they may not have been completely, you know, sort of just dreaming these things up. There is actually a credible, um, Vernon Roth is talking about this, there's, there's a credible way to do this. But there's something important here. Now, in 1976, at Lawrence Lab, where I worked, not my group, but a group that I was working with later, they actually put lead into the target chamber, something called the Bevatron. This was a linear accelerator that super pumped particles and then went to a big circular accelerator, accelerator called the Bevatron. And in the other end, they smashed into the nuclei of lead, blew it up a little bit, reassembled, and actually made gold. Now, it took a lot of energy, lots of energy, $10,000 worth, roughly, to make a couple of micrograms, but it could be done. Now, what if, just what if, we had a superconductive collider of sorts? Hmm, where have I heard that word before? I wonder, whoops, sorry. Um, how about that, yes, indeed. Now, this, by the way, is called the table of nuclides, and for anyone that's had a little bit of physics, they'll probably remember this. The basic idea is that all the major elements have their daughter and subdaughter isotopes. An isotope, in very plain language, is where you have an imbalance between the protons and neutrons. You temporarily, the atoms, uh, I'm sorry, the nuclei kind of goes through a state of confusion, as it were, and tries to find equilibrium. 
So it's constantly ejecting material, both in, in EMF and also in particles. But the whole idea is that there's a series of nuclides that every element can be um, derived from. Now, this is interesting because if you're going to invent a new element or create an element that's not commonly available, this gives you a roadmap. Now, there's some elements which are really interesting. Anybody uh, think of something about element 115? Anybody ever hear this before? Mmm, gee. I wonder what that might be useful for, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Um, I could give a three-hour lecture on anti-gravity, and I can't because I'll be thrown off the stage. But let's just say that this is a very interesting element for that purpose. Okay. We've all seen, just last night we were looking up in the sky, we saw some things flying around. Well, I wonder what those things are. Hmm. I wonder. Um, now, I'm going to give you a clue. See this over here? Lockheed Martin. What do they do? They make, you know, spacecraft and rockets and planes and things. What do they have here? See something familiar? Hmm, I wonder what they're up to. I just wonder. Well, okay, some folks say that transmutation is a way to make radioactive waste less radioactive, and that's true. Japan and France both are doing this now. This is a French facility right here. Oops, sorry. To make that possible. And in fact, the French, of course, are actually way ahead of us in terms of now, I'm not really pro-nuclear, but there is a certain point where it becomes relevant. And these new reactors that have these, like, pebbles instead of the, the fuel rods, I see a place where that could be feasible. And if you can use transmutation to make them less radioactive after this bend, okay, fine, lovely. But what else can you do? Whoops. What else? I just wonder. Hmm, let's see. Heavy elements. Uh, protons, antiprotons. Hmm, I wonder what happens when those things come together. Dot, dot, dot. Well, this is one design for a wingless airplane. Hmm. Or how about this? How about this? This is in Italy. This is a real machine. Not a drawing, a real machine. This thing flies. See any propellers? Hmm. I wonder what's going on there. What, what, what's going on? Wait, 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 wait. wait. What, no propellers. Hmm. What is going on there? Well, this is some early drawings. Um, these, by the way, are pieces of machinery from other parts of the world. This one here in particular is a Russian design right here. They're using a superconductive ceramic in counter-rotating um, uh, uh, platens to create a field that creates a sort of a kind of a gravity well of sorts. There's different systems. This is a magnetic system over here. But now we go here. Whoops. Uh, oh, by the way, this is LaserRay, the company in Italy that made the helicopter. This is their business plan. They plan to put these on the market as a commercial aircraft system. Do you see any jets? See any wings? Hmm, what are these guys doing? I mean, what is this, like lunacy or something? Well, not so fast. Now, my father worked for Boeing. More water, I'm sorry. More water. Okay, fine. More water. So about four, about six years ago, actually, um, Boeing made a big presentation. They said, we got these Russians. They're building a gravity displacement devices, they called it. Then a year or so later, they said, well, we're looking into it, da, da, da. And then all of a sudden, there was no more publications. Well, I worked in black stuff for a while. I can tell you from personal experience, that means one of two things. Either A, it didn't work, or B, it worked really well, and I'm not going to say much more about it. So what do you think now? Element 115, Boeing, Lockheed, things without wings, any ideas? Okay, just I'll let you think about that for a while. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, there's too many slides and I, I can't do all this, but this is some, these are actual patents that have been filed, um, just to, I can talk about this later. But um, when I was eight or nine years old, I went to Seattle World's Fair and they had this display, this rotating, you could, I used to play pinball with the big steel balls. So there was this machine where you could shoot a ball into this like uh, vortex I watched the ball spin around, spin around, go through the end of the little hole. That was a demonstration of gravity walls. I was a young kid then, but I was a fanatic for that weird science. And when I saw that, I would dream about gravity walls. I mean, I was a weird kid. I didn't do baseball, I didn't do football, didn't care about the girls that much, but I loved this kind of stuff. I mean, I was just like fanatical. I was a nutcase. Okay, fine. I'm glad I didn't have, the, you know, those, those drugs for AFD kids or whatever? I'm glad I didn't have those because I would have been a lost case. But anyway, the point is this. I was at Stanford a couple years ago. I happened to walk into the Gravity Research Lab. 
Because they had, this is Stanford now. Because what they had going on. Actual models of how to create this sort of a contrived gravity well, you know, modeling on a computer and examining different ideas. I wonder why they're doing this. Hmm, dot, 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 okay. Well, you know, okay, so there was actually an experiment. Now, uh, are people familiar with special relativity? More or less, kind of, sort of, a little bit. Uh, there's something called frame drag. Frame drag says that if you have a spinning body, it will pull the time-space continuum around it. Like, like, if you have a bowl of pudding, you're stirring with a spoon, and the pudding kind of follows the spoon around, and then it, velocity decreases exponentially as you go away from the spoon. Well, gravity wells are kind of the same thing. And what happens is, well, many years ago, back in the well, 60s, actually, a plane was flown, atomic clock up in, the, uh, up in the atmosphere, atomic clock on the ground, a couple of nanoseconds of difference, but they could prove it. So now, the modern version, Stanford and some other folks built an instrument to say, can we measure in a much more precise way the exact, I mean, the exact frame drag of planet Earth? This is it. They did it. So for those folks that say gravity walls don't exist and frame drag can't be done and nobody can make this thing happen, well, you know, I have a different idea in mind. Okay. So um, the one thing I wanted to call your attention to is this gadget in the middle, this thing called a squid. Superconducting quantum interference device. Why is that relevant? Here it's why. Here. Um, now you can buy one of these, by the way. Japan makes these. They're expensive. They're big. They require liquid helium. I, I actually used them one time. But now imagine if you had other materials. Just imagine for a moment. What if you could make a smaller one? What if you could make one with superconductive polymers? Remember quantum polymer? Remember those MPI guys? Now, what else can you do besides that? How about consciousness? How about measuring the quantum entanglement artifacts of consciousness from a distance, from halfway around the world? Sound crazy? Not really. But hold that time for a minute. I'm going to skip a few frames. Whoops, sorry. Um, yeah, here's the guy, MBI. Okay, so I'm going to skip a few things. Magnetic lift trains. Um, a friend of mine was doing this. I can't name him because I agree not to. But he went to China, first prototype in China. Now in Shanghai, you can actually ride that very train. Hmm? Okay, superconductivity, magnetics. Okay, so I'm going to skip a few more items. Now, what we're working on, by the way, is something called the Magnetic railgun is a weapon that can propel something very fast. I won't say how fast, but it's fast. I won't say that much. Uh, okay, here's some what's called zero time of flight weapons. I'm sorry, but this is where this stuff goes sometimes. I did work in a big laser, so I must confess my own personal thoughts here. Um, this is now the flyable version. This is solid like, dyed lasers, but now we have this. This is a real piece of machinery. This is Antares, if you will, but in the plain version. And here's a truck mounted version. And soon you're going to have the helicopter mounted version. Here we go, like so, um, like that. And notice the uh, project is called Peace Through Light. I, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to grow that exactly, but OK. OK, so I'm going to skip some last frames here. Please forgive. Uh, when I was doing Star Wars, this is what we're trying to do. And I don't want to see this. Please, I don't want to see weapons in space. I, please, I don't want to see this, but you know. OK, so let me skip some stuff. Hold on, hold on, let me just get to the last thing. And by the way, um, I really, really, really like Sir Charles's presentation because, oh God, now the gadget's not working. Whoops, the gadget, it died. What have I done, killed the batteries? Oh no, he did this on purpose. My time's up, <laughs> oh well. Well anyway, the batteries are dead. Um, okay, um, oh look at that, it's working, my gosh. Okay, let's skip this then. What are we doing here? Come on, keep going. Nice machine, okay. I want to get to the last slide, that's all I want to do. Okay, these are organic semiconductors. Fine, last slide, please, please. Let's get there, let's get there, let's get there. This is the wearable stuff, by the way. Okay, the plan for just one terawatt of energy. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I can't get there fast enough. Well, okay, look. The last slide says two things. Oh, hold on. Is it doing it by itself? Oh, look at that. It's self-actuating. The quantum interaction, oh yes, okay, fine. Well, anyway, so the point is this. My last two slides were the following thing. Slide one showed a tank. It said the new high-tech oil rig. And let me preface this by saying I have extreme respect, I mean profound respect, for all of our men and women who put on a uniform after 9-11, they wanted to volunteer to serve their country. I totally get I mean, if I were younger myself, I probably would have done the same. The fact that they were lied to and sent there under the worst of all possible sort of bogus reasons, that part I have disagreement with, but I haven't. 
utmost respect for our folks in uniform. But in the slide I show a couple of guys on a tank saying the new oil rig. The next slide is a pair of young high school girls in a, in a classroom doing a chemistry experiment. And the caption is, this is who we work for. And I mean this quite honestly. This is who we work for. I mean, I'm over the hill like most of the folks in here we've seen in our life. And we have kids and grandkids, all that. Right. But the world that's coming around the corner, if we don't fix this, if we don't make a determination that we are going to turn this around, all bets are off. And so my thought to you is, look, we're spending $10 billion a month for the you know, tank oil rig version as opposed to the you know, kids in the classroom doing nanotech. You know, what do you think is a better investment? Any thoughts? Yeah. So my final comment before I walk off the stage. I remember in World War II, there was a famous poster, yeah, Rose of the Riveter, and it said, we can do this. And when people tell me that we can't do alternative energy, that we can't do zero point, that we can't do over unity magnetics, that we can't do whatever it is, I get kind of angry. I'm a peaceful guy, but I'm little angry. I don't like being lied to, because I look them right back and square in the eye and say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. In this context, words like cannot be done, not possible, they don't exist in my vocabulary. Because just like that Ruby the Ro Rizzy, <laughs> Rosie and the Riveter poster, Yes, we can. We can do this. Thank you so much for your time and attention. You know, the only problem with Charles is we didn't have enough time. <laughs> Charles, Charles just gave three and a half years of nanoengineering technology and background in, uh, in 105 minutes. And some of it was, I had two comments about the... Uh, about Charles talking so fast that you know they were having trouble understanding him. Well, I listened on the headset, and if you get the DVD, is Charles is extremely clear, and uh, you and you can you can play it all back, and it's very very good. Um, he'll be out in the foyer for Q and A. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Charles Osman. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay.